are things what they seem? Good evening. My name's Anthea Turner. <laughs> or is it? Another question. <laughs> Why has nobody bothered to make potato-flavoured crisps? If you can buy prawn cocktail crisps, why can't you buy prawn cocktail potatoes? <laughs> Curiously, the last three American astronauts in space were Bill Prawn, William Cocktail and Ferdinand Potatoes. <laughs> or were they? The answer's no. I made it up, but you believed me. That's how easy it is to be fooled. But we won't be fooled on Does China Exist? We're going to discover the truth. And what's more, we're going to discover the truth behind the truth. And if there's anything behind that, we'll discover that as well. <laughs> Should we believe in something that we haven't actually experienced? None of us have been to China. How do we know it's there? I have with me Mr Ling Cha Hua, who's a representative of the Chinese government. And I'll be asking him later to prove that China exists. <laughs> we'll come back to that. But first, how fast can a man run. The current world record for the 100 metres stands at 9.84 seconds. But we have of us here Mrs Lilly. Now, Mrs Lilly, I understand you're disputing that record. Yes, I am. My husband, Douglas, has broken the 100 metre records by three seconds. And I understand you captured this athletic achievement on the family camcorder. Yes, I did. Let's have a look. Your Athletics Association have refused to ratify this record. Yes, that's right. He failed the drugs test. <laughs> he did have a bottle of whiskey and a hundred paracetamol inside of him, didn't he? Yes, I suppose so. Well, thank you for that. So how fast can a man run? Obviously not as fast as a cheetah, but supposing the man was on a bicycle. We have here from the Army School of Physical Education, Staff Sergeant Michael Tiplady. <laughs> Michael. Evening, Paul. Now, during the Gulf War, you cycled into the path of an enemy tank whilst being strafed by Iraqi fighter planes. Well, that's a bit exaggerated. I once cycled 30 miles of the Pennine Way during a thunderstorm. <laughs> well, it's all cycling, isn't it? Oh, well, we've got the bicycle here and the speedometer, so the audience can see how you're doing. But for now, thank you very much, Michael Tiplady. And now it's time for the first of our audience votes tonight. Let's see if we can gauge the mood of the nation. Ladies and gentlemen, press your buzzers now. <laughs> and let's look at the results. 62% say Brown looks good on a man. 29% say the Forestry Commission should do more, and 9% say Paddy Ashdown. <laughs> Graphology. The study of handwriting. Does our handwriting illustrate our character? How much can we tell from our handwriting? We have with us in the studio tonight an expert on the subject of handwriting. Will you please welcome handwriting expert Joyce Wynne Stanley? Now, Joyce, what exactly is graphology? It's the study of handwriting. Good. Now, <laughs> we've prepared you a little test. We've got a sample of three different handwritings, all from famous people, and we want you to tell us who those people are by studying their handwriting alone, OK? Here's the first letter. This one's from 1963. So, for the sake of the audience, I shall read out the text. Here we go. <laughs> Dear Una, I was so surprised when Bachelor Boy became number one last week. <laughs> the tour with the shadows is going very well, and everywhere I go, people shout, I love you, Cliff. <laughs> Joyce, any ideas? Well, my first thought was a politician. Mm. But looking at the upward stroke of the letters, I think it's more likely to be somebody in show business. Outgoing. The sort of person you might expect to stand up and sing at a tennis match. <laughs> Jeremy Paxman. <laughs> uh, no, but that's close enough. All right, uh, let's have a look at the second one. Uh, this one's from 1969. Again, I'll, I'll read the text for the audience here. Here we go. Dear Buzz, 
It doesn't seem three months since we spoke to each other on the surface of the moon. <laughs> Everybody seems to like my one giant leap for mankind speech. While I'm on the subject, I think I left my cigarette lighter in a sea of tranquility. <laughs> you didn't happen to pick it up, did you? Only NASA had engraved it, especially with the words, Good luck, Neil, on your Apollo 11 mission. <laughs> Joyce. Well, there's something about it that immediately suggests Noel Edmonds. Mm. <laughs> yes, the, the letter T certainly suggests this jockey. But I don't think that's right. The loop on the letter G is highly characteristic of somebody who's done a lot of travelling. Certainly someone with a sense of adventure and a scientific background. Mike Tyson. <laughs> no, but I'll give you that one. <laughs> and finally, whose signature is this? <laughs> Ooh. Well, it's difficult with so few letters. And oddly, the signature starts off in black ink and ends up in white. <laughs> Possibly an egomaniac, with skin trouble, <laughs> and an unhealthy interest in underage... No, I'm sorry, you're wrong. <laughs> it's Michael Jackson. But I think Joyce Winstan, you've definitely proved that graphology is a wonderful thing. A round of applause for Joyce Winstan. <laughs> and coming up later in the programme, who shot President Kennedy? We have startling new evidence, plus hot tips on bottling jam. <laughs> In the world of telepathy, there are many charlatans. People who claim to have psychic powers who are, in reality, nothing more than hucksters. Hucksters peddling hokum. But we have us in the studio tonight a man who claims to be the genuine article. Will you please welcome Duval? Now, Duval, I understand your assistant has an ordinary pack of cards. Indeed, I have. I shuffle the cards. I select a card. This is the card. Duval, what is it, Queen of Spades? <laughs> Think of the card, Queen of Spades. Duval, name the card. Two of... Three of... Queen of Spain! <laughs> I don't know, I think there's a trick here somewhere. This time you don't say anything, no hidden clues. And this time I'll select the card. Very well. Duval agrees. But you really must concentrate if Duval is to pick up your thoughts. All right. Uh, stick the card to your forehead. All right. I select the card. Duval. <laughs> Duval. <laughs> Name the card. I can't be expected to work under this sort of pressure. Duval! <laughs> Name the card. Jack of Clubs. Come on, Duval, think. <laughs> Nine of Spades. Duval! <laughs> I'm sorry I had to push him, ladies and gentlemen, but these things must be done scientifically. <laughs> there are many conspiracy theories about the death of President Kennedy. There's even a conspiracy theory that a number of conspiracy theories is in itself a conspiracy. But I have with me a man who claims to know the truth about the Kennedy assassination, Frank Brittle. Now, Frank, what exactly is your theory? Uh, well, uh, up to about a year ago, Paul, I didn't really know any more about it than, than anyone else, you know, but then uh, we went on holiday uh, to the Isle of Wight. Uh, and uh, I went into a fish and chip shop uh, and then it, it came to me in a flash, really, that, that President Kennedy wasn't dead. Extraordinary. And how did you know that President Kennedy wasn't dead? Well, he was the bloke serving me behind the counter. <laughs> and what did you say to him? Uh, well, I said, uh, <coughs> cod and chips twice. Because <laughs> I'm a bit of a natural joker, you know. <laughs> and what did he say to you? Well, he said, uh, I believe in truth, uh, justice uh, and the American way uh, and the cod will be five minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. We've gone to the Isle of Wight, we've brought him back. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome President John F. Kennedy. Well, I can
can hardly believe it. I'm sitting here next to President John F. Kennedy and you're alive and well. Well, I guess I'm just a hell of a lucky guy. Well, you, you <laughs> certainly are. Now, tell me, how did you manage to cheat death in Dallas in 1963? I'm glad you asked me that question. The FBI insisted that I used a double for all public appearances. Oh, that would have been uh, Al Slimovitz Jr. That's right. Of course, we never thought anybody would, uh, would get shot. Sorry to interrupt you there. I'm sure there's something our audience will be fascinated to know. How long does it take to cook a piece of rock salmon from Frozen? <laughs> about 20 minutes. 20 minutes? But to get back to your question about Dallas, if you look at the footage, you can see down in the corner of the oh, screen... Sorry to butt in there. Um, what sort of batter mix do you use? <laughs> the standard batter mix. You know that when the motorcade was passing the grassy knoll... Well, I'm sorry I'm going to have to stop you there, Mr President, because we've done some more research. We were so fascinated by your story, we found you weren't the only person who cheated death in Dallas all those years ago. You mean Al Slimbervich survived? We've flown him all the way from Canada to be here tonight. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lee Harvey Oswald. <laughs> please, please, ladies and gentlemen, give him a chance. Nice to have you on the show, Lee. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> now, Lee, take a seat. You must be as surprised as the rest of us to see JFK sitting here. Yes, I certainly am. And I'd just like to say that when I shot you in 1963, it was nothing personal. Nothing personal? Look, Lee, <laughs> what I want to know is, we all saw you shot on live television by Jack Ruby. Well, Jack Ruby was firing blank bullets. That had nothing to do with it. If you want to know the truth about the Kennedy assassination, it could be summed up in one sentence. At about 10 o'clock that morning... I'm going to have to stop you there, Mr President, but I could listen to you for hours. So, that's Not Dead by Lee Harvey Oswald at 6 .99, and JFK's Missed at 8 .99. Coming up later, we meet the man who's headed 18 murder squads, plus Seedless or Chunky, that's our bottling jam item. <laughs> Mr Ling Cha Hua, does China exist? We'll come back to that. <laughs> and again, it's time to judge the mood of the nation tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, press your buzzers now. Turn around here. Now, 17% say I only eat chips. 26% say don't touch the horses. And a massive 57% of you have voted for apple chutney. <laughs> so, Paddy Ash down there, ousted by a fruit preserve. <laughs> I have a letter here from Mrs. Talbot of Twyford who writes Has anyone developed a machine that can play snooker? Well, we asked the boffins at Brunel University to see what they could come up with. First of all, they tried a manual typewriter with limited success. <laughs> they achieved better results with a hot point automatic. <laughs> but on high spin, the results were erratic. <laughs> Finally, they thought they'd cracked it earlier this year. So, Mrs. Talbot, the answer to your question is no. <laughs> Coming up soon, a man who claims he can read his own mind, plus bottling jam, <laughs> fact or fiction. <laughs> Flotation tanks, a means of relaxation and deep meditation, or merely a very expensive bath where you can't find the soap? <laughs> you decide. Or do you? 
<laughs> it's back to our speed challenge, so let's see how Michael's getting on. Well, Michael, you're up to 30 miles an hour. Do you think you can go faster than that? Oh, yes, Paul. In fact, my instructor at the Army Cycling Corps has taught me a method to increase my speed without expending any more energy. And how do you do that? I take the brake off. Well, do you think you should take the brake off, ladies and gentlemen? What do you think? <laughs> take the brake off. OK, Michael, take the brake off now. Oh, he's picking up speed. Give him a bit of encouragement, ladies and gentlemen. Go on, Michael. Go on, Michael. Go on, Michael. Get into the tub. Go on, Michael. There he is, 106 miles an hour. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael Tidlady. They now. Do you remember this? My hair just won't stay flat. Look. <laughs> so now I use Dr. Keffler's hair iron. <laughs> it puts your hair where it ought to be, tight against the scalp. <laughs> and the result? <laughs> Try it yourself. Ladies and gentlemen, will you please welcome the star of that commercial, Henry Willoughby. Now, Henry, that advert's been shown in 163 countries around the world. That must have made you a very rich man. Well, I was lucky. <laughs> I was in the right place at the right time. I still get recognised everywhere I go. And do you know? <laughs> I still use a Dr Kepler's hair iron. <laughs> Thank you, Henry Willoughby. <laughs> now, stress. How do you cope? Chief Inspector Lang, you've headed 18 murder squads. You've seen sights that would quell the stomach of an Aberdeen Angus. How do you relax? Well, I have a hobby. I spent the past 15 years building the world's smallest functional model railway. Well, let's see it operated. Certainly. <laughs> yeah, the detail is very impressive. Oh, I, I can see a little man waving a flag. Yes, if you look very carefully, you'll see the top button of his shirt's undone. Mm. Now, I know this doesn't conform to the British Rail standard of dress of the 1950s, but I think you'll agree it does add a nice touch of reality. Mm. Oh, oh, look, I can see there's a cat looking out the window at a signal box. Yes, another little detail. It's wearing an identity tag with its name and phone number on it. Perhaps we should give him a ring. It's only a model cat. It can't answer the phone. <laughs> oh, I see. Um, the detail really is quite extraordinary, but I think it's too much for our ordinary cameras. Could we bring on the special camera with the micromatic lens? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, I see now. Uh, that's been quite wonderful. That really is good. Uh, tell me, that train there, uh, can you make it run backwards? Yes, of course. <laughs> oh, that is truly wonderful. You must have spent a long time. And tell me, those trees, what are they made of? <laughs> Sorry about that. Still, uh, don't you think you're a little old to be playing with a toy train set? <laughs> you might have solved more of those murders if you hadn't spent so much time fannying around with a microscopic guards van. <laughs> Grow up. <laughs> Coming up, how fast can fast food get? A radical new system that will transform our lives. Plus, apricot or peach, which jams will you be bottling for the new millennium? <laughs> and I've got a fax here from a Mrs April McDowell who writes... What a shame that President Kennedy and Lee Harvey Oswald couldn't let bygones be bygones instead of acting like two bickering schoolboys at a charity football match. Well, I couldn't agree with you more, Mrs McDowell. Just to show there's no hard feelings, they're going to reenact that fateful day in Dallas. But remember, this is just for fun. Now, the motorcade should be on its way at any moment, and if we look, we'll see Lee Harvey Oswald get into position here at a sixth-floor window at a Texas bookstore depository. Now, we're not going to arm Lee. Once bitten, twice shy. So, Lee, <laughs> if you just point your finger at the president... Oh, and I understand the motorcade is on its way now. Here it comes. Oh, and it's a beautiful day here in Dallas. <laughs> the weather's good. The visibility's good. That'll suit Lee. I wonder what's going through the president's brain at the moment. He's looking very, very happy indeed. Oh, my God! Watch out, he's got a bum! He's got a bum! He's got a... The president's been hit! The president's been hit! Amazing scenes here. Lee Harvey Oswald blotted his copy book once again. I don't think Lee Harvey Oswald did it. The bum came from over there. What, from behind the armchair? Yeah, there was a bun man on the Parker Knoll. Well, there was a bun man on the park, and I've just heard, I just heard that Lee Harvey Oswald has been hit by Jack Ruby with a Victoria sponge. <laughs> so, history repeating itself, this time in cake form. 
And now, ladies and gentlemen, will you please welcome the man with the longest hair in Britain, Alan Muir. Hello, Alan. Hello, Paul. Well, I have to say, your hair doesn't look particularly long to me, Alan. Oh, well, that's because it's actually just a single hair. Now, I don't know whether your cameras can actually uh, pick it up. Oh, yes, yes, I see it, yes. Yeah, but it goes all the way down here, and mm -hmm. if you'd care to check inside the briefcase there... <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> well, if I can just show this to the audience, um, perhaps you, sir, you would confirm this was long hair, wouldn't you? It is definitely long hair. And maybe you, sir, that is long hair. It definitely is long hair. And, and maybe there, you, sir, that is long hair, isn't it? Yes, that's definitely long hair. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause, please, for Alan Muir. <laughs> And so, for the final time this evening, let's judge the mood of the nation tonight. Press your buzzers now. <laughs> and here are the final results. A Shakespearean actor in a fast car, 18%. Handstands, 23%. But a massive 59% of you have said, we prefer eggs. <laughs> Speaking in tongues, a verbal manifestation of the divine being, or a man asking a time with a mouthful of peanuts, <laughs> makes you think, or does it? <laughs> does the name Velocity mean anything to you? No? Well, it soon will. Watch this. Does the name Velocity mean anything to you? <laughs> no? It soon will. I'm standing here on the Four Elms Estate, Welling Garden City. Ordinary looking houses, you may think, but this community is taking part in a pilot scheme that will shortly revolutionise our shopping habits. Let's have a look inside. Well, Michael, this looks like an ordinary kitchen. So what's going on here? Well, it's a brilliant new scheme to deliver food quickly and efficiently to your home. And how does this scheme work? Well, let me show you. As in any conventional kitchen, there's hot and cold water, but there's also fresh pasteurised milk. <laughs> Piped in straight from the Velocifeed factory. Mm hmm. So far, very impressive. And there's more. Lentil soup. <laughs> ah, but supposing someone doesn't like soup or milk. OK. Fresh garden peas. And what's this one on the end? Well, try it yourself. <laughs> and the potato meter tells you how much you've used, so you only pay for what you eat. Ah, you only pay for what you eat. Well, let's ask some of your customers what they think about it. Yes, turn that hose pipe off! I'm only washing the car. You're washing it with balsamic vinegar! Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Peter Worrell, you're the chairman of Velocity. We've just seen a man showered with Brussels sprouts. <laughs> there seems to be a lot of dissatisfied customers out there. That was one family out of 500. I can assure you that there are many other people who are more than happy with our service. Well, let's find out. We have some of them in the audience. Uh, hey, you, madam. Last month, our orange juice pipe froze up completely. So it's a lollipipe. Oh, lollipipe. Yeah. There's, there's no such thing as a lollipipe. This lady's got frozen pipes. You should get your pipes like, madam, by one of our recommended plumbers. We've had your plumbers round three times. We've still got pasta in our boiler. Yeah, We're running our central eating system on spaghetti. Is that what we fall war for? No. Trap all our radiators boned up with pesto. Is it? No. <laughs> look, look. The whole point of running this pilot scheme is to iron out the teething troubles before we go national. Never mind all that. I got a letter here from a Mrs. Williams in Cardiff. Half a pound of cherries and a B day. Explain that, Mr. Warren. <laughs> We're not even running our scheme in Cardiff. Just answer the question, you, sir. Yeah, I, I don't know if you know Oldham, but I've Could lived there. Could you get there. to the point, please? Yes, the point is that my brother in law has just moved to Oldham. Now, in Oldham Town Centre, they've got a Perspex Town Hall. Oh, I'm sorry, I right? haven't got much time. Uh, you, sir? I read somewhere there's going to be a pea shortage next year. What about that, then? Yeah, yeah that. that. I can assure you people in the audience and everybody watching at home, there will be peas for everyone. What, minted? 
Well, I tell you, I've got a report here from the official pee watchdog, off pee. <laughs> 25% leakages of peas from the main pea pipe. That's an awful lot of peas, Mr. Wall. What are people going to do next year when there's a pea drought, Mr. Wall? Yeah. Yeah. We've just signed a contract with a multinational pea supplier in Bolivia. We We're don't want hot. foreign peas coming into this country. No. That's our it that got started. Yeah. 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 Are we going to see Hitler back again, Mr. Wall? Yeah. These pipes are dangerous. They operate under extremely high pressure. I have to agree with you. These pipes are very dangerous. Last week, a Labrador suffered concussion after being hit by a parsnip. <laughs> you, sir, you, sir. I was born in the state of Texas. <laughs> the finest state in the whole of the USA. Oh, sure, the winters are hard. Damned hard. But if you've got the pioneer spirit, there isn't a finer place on God's good earth. Good point. <laughs> uh, you, you, sir. Hold them. The town hall's not made of perspex. It's made out of tricetylene 300. It's like perspex, but it's got a far superior weight bearing capacity. No, it's not. Don't get me started on Oldham, mate! Look, 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 never mind Oldham. I've got the catalogue of complaints here, or 300. A man here, you fitted the wrong kind of washer to his pea tap. Instead of the fresh garden peas you promised, he ended up with a thick green sludge. <laughs> I have lived in Oldham. Never mind Oldham! <laughs> Thick green sludge, Mr. Worrell! All right. All right, so he's the first person to get mushy peas. Ah, oh, that's it. It. Anyway, it's a minor complaint. You're just splitting hair. And you, Mr. Worrell, are just splitting peas. That's the last word on the subject. We're running out of time. Let's check on with Michael Tiplady. <laughs> Michael, congratulations. Thanks, Paul. Let's have a look at the last few seconds of your record breaking attempt. Right, well, at this point, I was pedalling fast. Yeah. Then I decided to pedal a bit faster. And then I pedalled faster than that. And what were you thinking about at this point? Well, I thought, I've got to pedal a bit faster, cos, yeah. I mean, I was pedalling fast, but I reckon I could pedal a bit faster. And there you are, pedalling at 106 miles an hour. But remember, the original question was, is a man on a bicycle faster than a cheetah? Let's work that out one way or the other. <laughs> and just look at us! <laughs> 88 miles an hour, which is not as good as our champion, ladies and gentlemen, Michael Tipley! <laughs> and we really are running out of time now. Mr. Lin Chao does China exist? Well, that's something for us to all be thinking about. Bubbling jam.